Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'm going to be help moderating tonight along with uh, other functions. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we will have our speaker who will speak. Uh, I'm sorry, first we'll have a program of, of announcements. Then we'll have our speaker. Then we'll have a period of questions and answers. After our question and answer period, we will then have our infamous rebuttal period. We must be out by 8.45, so our speaker will get the last word. And please, uh, when you leave the room, we have to be cleared by 8.45. Restaurant closes at 9. If you have a cell phone or something, I, you know, if you can turn it off or turn it to vibrate so we don't interrupt our speaker tonight, as we all know, let's welcome tonight's speaker, Charlie Paydock, who's going to be doing a historic photographic presentation of the New York and Chicago RR. And uh, he's also it. And, uh, all right. Charlie says, let's just want to clear it up. Then I can come back later. Let's see Charlie's presentation on the Transcontinental Railroad. Nice. Okay. All right, let's see here. We've got um, a rather lengthy program. We may have a little break in the middle. I'm not certain, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, halfway through, I'll ask if you'd like about five minutes. But it's, uh, this is a fascinating event in the history of the nation. The more I studied it, the more I discovered uh, the various aspects of it that touch many things. And it reflects very much upon the character of us as a nation. Anyhow, um, this program will cover four parts. Uh, the historical development of transportation in general. Number two, the movement west. Uh, the third part will be the uh, development of the first steam engines and the American standard locomotive, which became the standard mode of transportation around the world. And the fourth thing will be, we'll focus the lengthy part, will be on the building, the actual construction of the Transcontinental Railroad itself, at a, an event which has been called the engineering, one of the major engineering marvels of all time, as well as one of the biggest swindles of all time. <laughs> uh, but we'll also take a little trip on the finished route once it's done, a little trip uh, on the railroad. So, um, the, uh, if we look upon the inventions that have had the biggest impact on humanity, certainly number one would be the wheel. Uh, developed shortly after the first civilizations uh, came about. And there you see uh, the linkage, what we call the linkage, or rods on a locomotive, a steam locomotive. And there's various types of these. We didn't get into the technology here. But uh, those are, also you can see how the wheels are counterbalanced. Um, but that's what we're talking about. The railroads have played a part in the history of this nation. Here you see the commemorative stamp earlier uh, of this event, as well as the celebration of Casey Jones, who wrecked his locomotive and became a hero in the process. Um, but that shows you uh, where our, our history can be. If you are interested in this topic, I'll begin in events instead of the end. There's any number of very, very good books written about this. Stephen Ambrose's Nothing Like It in the World is the standard and the easiest to get through. The Iron Road covers all sorts of things about railroads around the world, including the United States. The Empire Express is an amazing publication. The author of this, it just came out not too long ago. This gentleman spent 14 years writing this book which I've tried to work my way through, but it's in, it covers entirely uh, hundreds of pages in the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. Um, and, and the last one is the Great Railway Revolution. Is that a separate topic of many, many historical pursuits? Is the influence of the railroads 
have had on the culture of people of this nation and other nations as well. Uh, probably more so than any other single thing that we can often encounter. Very when you, you call this big history, uh, among the topics of big history, certainly uh, uh, transportation. Uh, now, the thing about transportation in the United States, in early America, and in the world for that matter, is that it had not changed since the time of Julius Caesar. Uh, basically, a horse, which is considered about four miles per hour. Uh, so, transportation had not changed. Uh, the technology of the sail, wind powered craft, I think had achieved its, its pinnacle. It wasn't going to advance any further. It did meet the needs, but it also explains the fact that um, the 90% uh, of the people in the world live adjacent to a body of water. Uh, the, but the, the, the real need, the limitation, of course, to sailcraft if you did not have any access to the interior, also, they had a very limited tonnage. I'm amazed what they could pack in these ships, but that's basically it. Uh, another thing about sailing vessels, the Transcontinental Railroad is very often sent to complete the work of Columbus, uh, in the sense that it provided a path to the Orient. And the railroad, in fact, was seen as a means, and given the historical context, a means of uh, uh, fostering trade with the Asian uh, continent. Um, let's see. Okay, um, this is just some things about sail technology. That's what I mean. It, it had it advanced about as far as it could go. This is the Constitution in Boston, which I visited. The other thing about inland getting inland, if you if you attempted to. And I've only seen this once anywhere, uh, is a cargo canoe. Uh, this, this is about the only means using uh, water traffic uh, for getting inland. Uh, but again, you can see the limitations of uh, the thing. Uh, the next thing that was being developed was um, the canals. And most people aren't aware of the thousands of miles of canals, literally the projects in the United States, to get off the coastline towards the interior. Uh, these are mostly on the west coast, such as this, the Chesapeake and Ohio, the CNO Canal, the main line of Pennsylvania, out by Philadelphia. I lived along the main line, which was a means of getting, trying to reach uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, and of course, it, we ended up later with the INN Illinois and Michigan Canal. The problem with these are, they're frozen a good portion of the year. Uh, they're four feet deep, 40 feet wide. And actually there's traffic on them. From what I've read, they couldn't accommodate. They were limited uh, and there was congestion in their complaints that you goods were not being delivered in an expeditious fashion. Uh, let's see here. Uh, there you see the, the other thing with the flat boats, the river boats, uh, which took down the river, such as the Mississippi, uh, in, at least in one direction. Um, there's the keel boats. Uh, and there's you have the canal boats. There's this one that's suited for passenger traffic, uh, as you can see. Um, this is one in Cumberland, Maryland, on the CNO Canal, <laughs> and that's a merchandise. And you can see it's limited again to about four miles per hour, as fast as the mule will walk. Uh, they actually, the families, when I read the the canal boat owner, his family used to live on board these vessels. Uh, there's another one, and I'll have a photograph of one. Um, taken carrying uh, lumber. And the next, of course, was to power it, uh, the steamboats. There were about a thousand steamboats plying the rivers of the United States, uh, flat bottom boats. Uh, 
they didn't quite have the technology down uh, as a hazardous mode of travel, if anything. Um, and then you can see a little further on in development. Still, uh, um, and these were used successively, by the way, to furnish and bring supplies for the Transcontinental Railroad. The other mode of travel, uh, of course, was a stagecoach. Um, and again, this was, uh, we're talking maybe 15 miles, 20 miles to day tops. Um, certainly not, and limited, limited passenger capacity, certainly not a, I don't even know if merit. The other mode of transport that was used, and we'll come across the trails, were the kind of soda wagons. Um, supposedly they were uh, curved like that so they could float and the goods would sink towards the center. Um, but that was uh, the only alternative, uh, a significant investment. There you see another one I came across. <laughs> um, uh, then again, the uh, plank roads and so forth didn't meet the needs of a, a bustling economy. These are just some quick charts uh, to compare the, if you were leaving New York City on the East Coast, how long it would take you. And you can see it in 1800. Um, and then it speeded up a little bit, about 1830. Uh, and then you see around 1857, which is about the time period we're going to be talking about. Uh, I have some questions about the figures on here, but nevertheless you can see um, that certainly the, the rate of travel was an issue here. I just can't fathom some of the times that people spent in transit. Okay. Uh, the normal, the thing that we found in the United States, is, and we'll get to the maps later, was that getting to, connecting the east and west coast was you had two options. Uh, you could go um, by land, uh, by wagon, anywhere from five to eight months. Um, you could take a shorter route through uh, Panama or um, Nicaragua, uh, and that was four to six months. And, and then the other way was all the way around South America. And that's how they had to bring supplies uh, for the Transcon all the way around. It was a very lengthy voyage. And if you tried to go through Panama, it took a month at least, riding a donkey. Uh, it was a very hazardous trip. I read about one account, there was a group of 11 people and only one person survived. They came down with uh, yellow, fever. yellow fever and other tropical illnesses. Uh, later on, it took the life of one of the, the engineer of the, the, the Transcon, uh, Judah. Uh, but anyhow, that's crossing Panama. Somebody came along, and this technically could be regarded as the first transcontinental railroad. But there was, in fact, a Panama Railroad. <laughs> Built in 1855, uh, it traveled about 31 miles. It was a fascinating railroad in the sense like if you landed from the Atlantic, you would board, get, in, get off your sea vessel, and you would travel southeast in order to contribute to you, your trip to the Pacific port. It actually traveled to the southeast. Fairly expensive, twenty-five dollars in gold, but compared to uh, a donkey or raft trip, it might be well worth it. Um, I'm going to have all kinds of maps later on, but I thought it would be a good idea to show what areas we were talking about. If you're talking about movement west, uh, on the lower right, you can see the territorial advances of the United States. This map's a little dated because uh, uh, Oregon, Washington, had become a state already. 
Uh, why are you turning me now? The manager just said it's too loud. Oh, all right. We can hear you fine. The, uh, um, up a little bit, Andy. You do it. Huh? You do it. Um, California was just admitted to the statehood as well. But the other thing was, and we'll cover more about the Indian tribes, you can see that they encountered three tribes in particular, the Sioux, the Cheyenne, also the Arapaho, and the Pawnee. So these were the indigenous populations of the United States. Okay, I'm going to digress a little bit, and I don't know if a lot of this is going to interest you people. We won't spend a lot of time in it, but it's a bit of history that most people I don't think are aware of, was that what is the other development that took place in transportation that ended up with us building a railroad, that made the railroad a feasible idea in the first place? And that was the invention and development uh, beginning in around 1800 of the steam engine as a, as a vehicle. Now, carts and wheeled vehicles had been used dating back to 1350. Uh, in mining, mineral extraction. There, you can see the illustrations there of a guy with a cart, and they put it on these wooden, wooden things. Later on, they had metal. But uh, in the mining industry, uh, for getting um, uh, your mineral out of the mines, certainly this was worth it. Uh, the other thing was, yeah, as, as I mentioned, he had a development of the rail. There were all sorts of different designs that were advanced until they settled on the T-type rail. So you can see they didn't use logs, uh, ties in the beginning, but stones, they call sleepers. Um, that was the original version. Uh, another thing was they weren't of all metal. They took pieces of wood and, and put metal strips on it, called strip rail. Well, uh, there were problems with this because you couldn't you couldn't put a vehicle on there of, of, of any significant weight. You can see it just wouldn't hold it. All right, before we get advanced, we're going to be talking about the American locomotive is called a 440. And what exactly does that mean? Well, a nomenclature was developed among the railroad men uh, to to identify steam engines. And here you see an engine of 442. So you begin by counting the four wheels in the front, the power wheels in the middle, and then the trailing wheels under the firebox. And this is how all steam engines are identified. So uh, and here's a chart. I'm sorry, I wish I had a better one, but it lists you, as you can see, as, as you add wheels of different types, powered wheels and unpowered wheels, uh, and that particular names have been used over the years. Uh, Pacific type is a very common type. Consolidation is another type. Um, depends on who, who came up with the first design gets the name at prairie type locomotives, decapods, just 10 wheels, things like that. But that's the nomenclature, and that's why we call, you'll see why it's called a 440. <laughs> now, railroads were just coming in. The, one of the first was, this, in, there were two railroads in England, the Stockton and Darlington uh, Railroad, um, which they, we're experimenting with, we'll see, uh, the earliest type of locomotive usage. It really was, now there's a difference between a railroad and a tramway. What we saw earlier, if it's just something for mining, that's a tramway. And the Stockton and Darlington was largely a tramway. It serviced mines, but somebody came up with the idea of putting a coach on it, pulled by a horse, they also had engines on it. It, it, it didn't work. It's sometimes it didn't work yet. You, you can operate a common carrier, but uh, the other thing was 
The reason they came up with passenger services, as I said, this essentially was used to bring ore cars to and from the mine. And the miners used to hop on the ore cars in the morning to get a ride to work. And then at the end of the day, they would hop on the ore cars to go home. So somebody said, why don't we do this for regular people and charge a few bucks and there were other things that were tried, wind-powered uh, things. Uh, the first, and then somebody came up with a passenger-type vehicle, uh, as, as I said, as for carrying passengers. <laughs> now, the steam engine was coming in. You've all heard of James Watt, Mr. Newcomen, that those were at what we call atmospheric engines. They were very slow operating and under low, low pressure. And even then you can see that this is not really a steam engine here. That's a portable steam engine. It's not really a locomotive. And there were other developments, pistons. Uh, and you can see how the te technology was developing. But from the atmospheric low pressure, somebody said, well, let's try the operating one of these at high pressure and see if it can propel a vehicle. Uh, now the first guy, one of my favorite guys in history, was the engineer Richard Trevitic. And he put together the first successful steam-powered locomotive to hold the load on rails in 1804. He uh, he actually began driving it down the street. Uh, this is really considered more an industrial locomotive than a road engine. And some people in the history of railroads don't acknowledge this as, uh, as a real steam engine, an industrial short line. But nevertheless, he did come up with it. It operated. It had um, one flue, one vent uh, down the center and one piston, uh, but anyhow it operated. Uh, and uh, he gave it, he also gave it the first guy to give names to, to engines. He, this is called the Penny Darren for the mine that it worked. He also came up with one, I like the one called Puffing Billy. And he also developed another one called Catch Me If You Can. <laughs> Catch Me If You Can. Was there one called uh, Bobby Hitting Charlie? <laughs> Uh, anyhow, there's another view. The beak wheel there is simply to counterbalance, but it did in fact operate, um, and he has given credit for developing. Now the other guys, there were under other people at work, and the people that are given the real credit for developing the steam locomotive were a father and son team of uh, Robert and George Stevenson. Uh, George and Robert Stevenson. And this was the first to haul a passenger. Um, again, this was on that same railroad, the Stockton and Darlington. And you can see they further refined it. And we'll get a little more further into their later designs. But this locomotive uh, was the successor to the uh, Trevetics. It's uh, locomotion number one. And there's another view of it. The guys in Britain love to make these things, recreate them. They've got all kinds of engines. They're really, really behind the thing. There, there's another look about it on the road. Uh, you can see some difficulties with the carriage and power to the rear trains. Now, the thing that's always talked about in railroad history, we saw what was coming along in the in the mining, the industrial locomotive, and the locomotion. But then, and that was on the Stockton and Darlington. But then there, in the real industrial revolution was coming in. And Manchester was the mill town, the center of the, the clothing industry uh, in England. And Liverpool, Liverpool was the port. So they actually came up with a real railroad. This was 30 some miles and even had a viaduct of 12 arches, a tunnel of about a mile, it crossed five miles of march. This was a real railroad they had invested in. 
and they were serious. This was big business was behind this uh, because they were having difficulty getting cotton to the mills and the finished product to the port. So they said, as a means of ascertaining, they were going to have a contest. And they gave certain specifications, and they were going to measure what would be the best vehicle to operate on there. They built the railroad, and then went looking for something to put on it. They actually were even going to have pulleys along the way, one mile apart, but or horse drawn. But uh, they decided to have a contest, uh, and it was a contest you had to make 10 trips of a mile and a half. And they'd measure how much fuel you used and you had to pull a certain weight. This was the basic entry of the Stevensons we saw earlier. Uh, and they entered a, a, a train called, a locomotive called the Rocket. Uh, the other entry was another one called the Novelty. Uh, they actually have 10, there were 10 entrants, but only three ended up performing the novelty. And you can see which design you would pick, who would put your money on. There was another one, and I like this one. This guy wasn't all, this guy actually had a regular job and built this on his own at night. Um, but he, there's this thing is called the Sans Parale, without, without equal. And uh, he built it entirely by himself uh, <laughs> versus these manufactured ones. And there you see the Stevenson's rocket. Now, the why uh, it took me a while to get here, but the reason the rocket is famous beyond measure in, in railroading is that he had six of the basic elements in a steam engine that you would find in every subsequent steam engine ever made. He came up with a really good design. From the draft, you can see the draft of the big chimney, can't see it on here, to the piston power. Um, but he, they came up with a design that's so good, it was used on, uh, there were 170,000 steam locomotives made in the United States. And every single one of them had incorporated some aspect of this and uh, this guy's design. He had another little, they, in, in England they call them series. He followed it up with something called the Planet Series, uh, longitudinal engine. Uh, it had 25 fire tubes, that was the major thing. It was really, he really could produce a lot of steam uh, with this engine. Actually, of those three engines you saw, all three of them worked pretty well. They redid the trial, and all three came out about 29 miles per hour. And all of them functioned pretty good. But this is a real low road locom locomotive. There you can see his earlier version on the right, and then he made some advances, put the cylinders in, and so forth. So now if you look at a locomotive, there you go. The, the sign, you can see there, to make incremental perfections. Let's see here. Now, the United States, they said, wow, that's pretty cool. Why don't we get one of those? And they did. Uh, in Pennsylvania, in the coal fields, uh, the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company uh, sent to England to get a locomotive of their own. And they bought one in England and put together in the States. Uh, and this is the first steam locomotive in the United States, the Sturbridge Lion. Uh, it weighed too much for the rails, weighed seven tons, and was really much too heavy. So they just took it and used it as a regular steam boiler. Actually, the Smithsonian came along and found this boiler in some factory, <laughs> retrieved it and put it on show in the museum. There really wasn't much to see. <laughs> but this is a dirty old boiler. But it was what they could find left of the Sturbridge Lion. And they had it until quite recently. They had, but there you go. Uh, they put it together on the Delaware and Hudson Railroad, um, a grasshopper type. 
these there's different types and classes of these if you get into the topic the, these are called grasshopper types they have kind of like an upward I call it an upward kettle uh, as opposed to longitudinal or pistons there's another one later designed see now this is another one uh, still the kettle type that I call it instead of the longitudinal Actually, one guy made one of these where you you just poured the coal in on the top, but you can never tell how big a fire you have. Anyhow, um, after that one, in Baltimore they were looking to put a, a a railroad in going to the Ohio River in Wheeling, West Virginia, and they were trying to jump the gun, so they wanted uh, they had someone on the railroad develop. Um, this is the first American-built locomotive, um, the Tom Thumb. It never really saw much operation, but uh, it was followed by the York, made in York, Pennsylvania, for the B&O Railroad. Now the B&O, despite, we'll see a couple others, has always claimed to be the first railroad in the United States. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's not really there, There's, but they've always kind of championed it, put up a big museum. So if they want to call themselves the first railroad, I say let them go ahead. <coughs> There's another one, I told you a kettle type. You can see now further advances, they start adding what I would term appliances. Um, as I said, the B&O, is always claiming, so they put on the 100th anniversary. Who else come see us? And we're the first railroad. Uh, further on, that's what I mean. On the B&O, you see them took how the designs merge. This is a Lafayette, uh, which ran on the B&O. That's in their museum, by the way. Uh, another for the earliest one, and this one's in the Smithsonian Institution, uh, was the Camden and Amboy. Uh, New Jersey, and this was the first locomotive made in any significant numbers. And actually, it has the distinction of being the first locomotive with a cowcatcher, the first co locomotive with a light, and the first locomotive with a bell. But uh, it's in the Smithsonian, and it comes out on the road every now and then. Uh, there you can see it. Uh, an actual photograph of it. Uh, you would have a guy that wrote in back, keep a lookout in back, and everything was okay. There you can see a uh, rep replica of it. Pennsylvania Railroad kind of claims it as their own. Um, now this is what I mean, this was a guy, there were now all of a sudden you had all kinds of manufacturers showing up and entering this lucrative market. Uh, the capitalists show up. This was the guy that made that locomotive by himself, Timothy Hackworth. Here's a nice little advertisement I like. You can call up this guy, Chaplin, and he's got a pretty nifty looking locomotive. And there are all kinds of locomotive works. Rogers locomotive is probably the most famous uh, of these. Um, and also, very quickly, uh, those were for hauling, as I say, for hauling freight or mineral, uh, industrial type, but they're also looking towards passenger service. So, uh, there's the car again. You can see the very first passenger car. Somebody said, why don't we take the coaches, stage coaches, and put wheels on it? Hey, no problem. This is what the Baltimore and Ohio did. And they even had one where you could sit up above. The only thing about this was they, these were burning wood. Uh, a lot of these locomotives, so you had sparks. And your clothes would catch on fire. <laughs> this was not a good ride. There you can see the b &O passenger service. Um, now, the another one that claims really they're two for the passenger railroads, uh, the Mohawk and Hudson. Uh, and Jonathan, are you here? 
the Mohawk and Hudson is famous for one of their first locomotive was called Brother Jonathan. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a photo. It ain't much to see. But anyhow, the Mohawk, uh, that was um, up in New York. In England, they were putting, yeah, they went one better. They put three coaches together. Looks pretty good. Yeah, you guys are, you know, nobody could think of a platform. You had to climb into these. Now, the one railroad that probably got the best claim to be the first one is down in Charleston, the Charleston and Hamburg Railroad. Uh, actually, they probably got the best claim. They built the railroad, it was 136 miles wide longest railroad in the world, uh, and uh, the best friend of Charleston. Um, the story of what, what happened is, they went out on the road, they had a real pretty locomotive, but they had a safety valve on it that blew, that blew a little whistle. So the new engineer, he didn't, he was found that sound irritating, so he stopped it, he blocked it. And needless to say, a short time later, the whole thing blew up. <laughs> uh, there you go, to see that? I don't know if I'd like driving it from the front like that, but that's it. <laughs> they did. Now, also with railroads, you got to have rolling stock. Uh, we don't need to dwell on this. You need boxcars, all of wood. They weren't like boxcars today. They were smaller, 28-foot uh, things all of wooden construction, you still may find a few way out there, uh, what I call junkyard railroads. Also, the other thing they used, and these were used extensively in the in the Transcontinental Railroad, were tank cars, what in those days they called them, tub, tub cars for water. They desperately needed, and they didn't have suitable locations for locating water. Uh, on, on those railroads out west. They had to go through what is called like the 40 mile desert. So these stub cars were used, the figures are astronomical. Every day they would send uh, train after train simply with water. This is just for fun, but just through a few crazy designs that uh, I came across. Um, here's the thing, an engine called the Monster. <laughs> which was tried out on the, an earlier railroad. Some guy was insistent he could figure out how to still use horses on rails. Uh, they called it a cycle bed or something like that. In Canada, some guy had some idea, I don't know why, to put the wheels up above and not on the rails, but he had all sorts of uh, theories or engineering background with it. And this rather strange contraption on the Camden Cam the Manapur is actually the, supposedly the first photograph of a steam engine taken. Um, it, it actually, this is called a Crampton. And he was a unique designer. And he had rationale behind each of the features of this. One of the features of this train was that the boiler was lower than the wheels for some reason. The center of gravity, you can get into the engine. But he actually designed something like 320 locomotives. But he was very innovative. And this is kind of a crackpot engine. But it's, it's pretty well known. Uh, they big wheels make trains go faster. Here's another one I found interesting. You got, I, don't, well, I guess that's the engineer in the front, and they, there's a fireman, I don't know, in the middle, maybe he's not in there. I like, here's two designs. You got a train that goes in both directions at once. Uh, and there's a train, well you don't need, you can make one long, you don't need the tender, could be part of it. Here's a cute little one to get around town, get around the railroad. That's kind of nifty, I like that. Uh, here's one little passenger apartment on the front. It's actually an inspection train. Um, okay, you can tell me what's unusual 
about the photo on the top. Come on. The second smokestack. The smokestack is should be here. On the other end. The smokestack is, is set next to the cab. Yeah, that, I don't think it's going to work. That's the draft. That you need the draft to go through the, maybe, it, I don't know what he was thinking. Maybe he thought it would work. Um, but no, that's the thing where Stevenson got the draft that draws from the fire and goes through, and that's where you get to chug, chug. Yes, he's going like that, you know, once it gets in motion. That's what I mean, once these machines get running, they continue running. Uh, these are called camel bats. Uh, it's futuristic design. There you go, Timmy. There's an engine powered with a thorium nuclear reactor. But these are camelback. They were used on the East Coast of New Jersey. I like this one. This one's pretty cool. You got little houses on the train. One for the fireman crew and one for the engineer. So, you know, they can take it easy and route. And lastly, uh, there's a little motorized car. Actually, this is another one, of that little carriage thing there. That's another Trevetic invention. He also had one for the streets. He had, he called this a bus. And he had big wheels on it because he thought it would give a softer ride. But he actually had to be, it worked. It worked pretty good. They, they made a replica of it, a modern one. And it worked fine. There was no problem. He had a little problems at first. I mean, it, it got out of control. He was going around London. He crashed through some rich lady's garden. That put an end to his things. Now we get into the American type locomotive. You know, and I have to read all of this. And anyhow, it was developed uh, before Faroe was first uh, uh, designed in the town where I lived in Norristown, Pennsylvania. Um, there's well over three quarters of all the steam locomotives in the country were uh, uh, American type locomotives. They were used all the way until 1952. They still had a 440 operating somewhere <laughs> in revenue in the United States. Um, it's powered by two axles and uh, a, a pilot wheel uh, a four power wait four pilot wheels, four power wheels, and, no, and nothing uh, about under the cab. The only disadvantage, if you guys are technical, to a uh, 440 is that the firebox could only be as wide as it would. It had to fit in between the wheels, which was the only disadvantage of this design. But it it had a, one unique feature is that given the springs and so forth, it could it could adapt to any kind of lousy track, any rail, bad rail, and it would do okay. It would maintain adhesion, at least three of the wear the power wheels at all times. So you could go anywhere regardless of how good or bad the rail was or the conditions or uh, yeah, then you'd keep still be in business. As I said, there's the first one uh, in, in uh, Norristown. Um, okay, this is the inside of a 440. Can anybody tell me what's, what's missing from this picture? No. <laughs> it has no labels on anything. You're supposed to know what you're doing. You're a real railroad, you're a real engineer. There's, there's no labels on anything. There you go, there's another one. Okay, quickly, and we'll be almost done with this background. Uh, the last other thing is wood. Wood is very poor, for, for it has very low caloric value. Uh, one ton of soft coal is equal to one and three quarts of wood or 2,000 pounds of, you know, 5,000 pounds of wood. But wood, is, wood, wood isn't going to make it. Uh, a lot of people wonder why, what they use, but they had to use coal. The other thing steam engines, people don't realize, is they use enormous quantities of water. Uh, you had to have 
um, the uh, refill them as 15, 20 miles, maybe 40 at the most. Um, you yeah, have water tanks. Uh, depending on what you're pulling and the speed they're using, uh, that's one thing people think they're just building a transcontinental railroad. You've got all kinds of infrastructure that goes along with it, mainly in these things. Uh, and you have to get the water into it. Uh, at Promontory, oh, this is a little bit of trivia. At Promontory, they use water from the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean in, in the engines as a, a nice little gesture. But you can see this is in Wyoming. Uh, they had to build windmills as well to get the water from the wells they had to dig. Uh, ties. You need ties. Uh, they would cut trees down in route on the, on the Western Pacific, the Central Pacific. Um, and this is a photo that I like because it's incredibly historically inaccurate. <laughs> and in about 10 different ways, I think you kill each other if you were doing something like this. You, um, the, uh, and then they have this guy, I think he's a surveyor. Now they had different functions, we'll see, in the railroad, but this, I guess this is like the surveyor behind the track crew of, I don't know where they get all that these guys are doing, but um, anyhow, the other thing talking about wood, uh, they, the railroad required the largest, the building of the largest trestles in the history of structures, the largest wooden structures up until that time in the world were done for the Transcontinental Railroad. These are, I took a tour with the railroad guys, and these were out west, the Camel Prairie Railroad, they called it, Railroad in the Sky. Uh, and these are identical to what they did, the trestle that they had a built en route. Um, there you can see, they would start at the bottom and build one row at a time, and second row and third row so forth. Uh, we'll see some more at the end. This is a, a monument that was recently put up in Toronto, Canada, honoring the men who built the railroad, and there you show them building a trestle. Uh, all right, this is just optics for fun. I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but there is a fleet of 440s in operation around the United States that are either on static display or in operation at a tourist museum. So this is a this is an actual Canadian Pacific locomotive uh, that would have been used. They had at least 50 in operation on both sides of the uh, construction. These are just really nice designs. One outfitted with a, a plow. They would use them for plowing. Uh, put, uh, actually, they came up with separate snow plows, but. There's some more. Virginia and Truckee. Truckee River is way out west uh, in the Sierras. Uh, there's another, you can see the evolution here of 440, but it qualifies. This is uh, in the southern shops of the Southern Railway. That's the engine uh, th that was in the that Civil War raid, the Texan. Uh, there's a B&O Railroad. In green, uh, went out west. That's Carolina. Engine, beautiful engines. Uh, that's out west. Which one is Virginia? Okay. That's the Eureka. Both of those. And just some engines that are out. You can see that one's ready to roll. Whoops. Down back. There's another one out there. Anybody know where these engines operate? California. Yeah, not really. Not Disneyland. Disneyland. Yeah. Disney, these are Disneyland locomotives. 
Yeah, Disney. California. Well, this is in Florida. Florida. Oh, Florida. Disney, and these are photos Florida. I took down there. Disney World. Florida. Whatever. Epcot. Whatever else. There's one in Florida. Orlando. Disney World. There's one in Florida or uh, Hawaii. That's kind of an interesting one. <laughs> uh, you have all seen this engine. And where have you seen this engine? In the movies. No. Is it the spike ceremony? In movies. This was owned by Paramount and the other studios. Yeah, it's the Pioneer. Okay, this is another one in the California Rail Museum. Uh, beautiful engine on static display. That's the Texan used in the great uh, Civil War raid. Uh, this is in the Smithsonian in Washington in the transportation exhibit. Um, an engine out on the road. Another <coughs> Western engine. This is the Jupiter. Um, these are the two locomotives. That promontory point we're getting out of it, uh, and the 119. <coughs> Those are the two transcon. There's the Jupiter. Those are common turntables found all up and down the construction of the Transcon Railroad because it's single line, so they had to have those around town. There's some engines locally. This is one a guy built right in Elgin. They just brought it out on the road two, three years ago or so. Uh, he built it in his own machine shop. He built the whole engine? Yes, he did. And then he's got a passenger car as well, a Lincoln-type funeral car. And I've seen it out, and he brings it out for railroad events. He built the engine um, by himself and uh, brings it out. This is just pictures that are said. Now you can see a little more modern approach of the 440, more contemporary type steam engine. So, and this is in the B and O Museum. This is another <coughs> advanced stage where they add another wheel. This is a Canadian 440 uh, in a Canadian exhibit. And this is the one in the Museum of Science and Industry, the Empire State Express, which claims they've had the world land speed record of exceeding the first vehicle to exceed 100 miles per hour. Brought to the 1893 World's Fair, the British have never, to this day, ever acknowledged this record. They adamantly refuse. If you look in any of their books, I have a guy here, cut out by the Brits, this engine doesn't even appear. <laughs> <laughs> they keep it out. Uh, there were ended up, there were three major locomotive <coughs> manufacturers, uh, Elko Locomotives, American Locomotive, and Schenectady. Uh, the Lima Locomotive Works in Ohio, and um, the, what is the, Philly, the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia. Uh, the American Locomotive came across this. This is in Norway. You think it's the old west, but no, these are some Norwegian guys with their. Uh, oh, this is just a quick thing. Very quickly, the the, the yeah, 440 in popular culture. Of course, Buster Keaton made uh, the movie The General, which I highly recommend seeing if you haven't seen it. It's really a good movie. The very first movie ever made, if you've taken film study course, is The Great Train Robbery. That's the first time they, they had a movie with a plot. I uh, ran across this in New York. I was watching the Macy's Parade. And this came down the block. This year's Rose Parade featured uh, two engines we saw earlier uh, in, on the New Year's Day Parade. Um, these are just other things I use in my Christmas cards. And we just had Easter. And you come across these no matter where you go. And even this little vehicle here I came across. I guess it's a 4 for all 
Anybody remember the Back to the Future movies? Yes. Yeah, yeah there it is. There it is. That's his, the scientists came up with that. Engine of the Future. Okay, now we're going to get into the railroad across the continent. Um, did you guys want a five minute break or no, should we keep going? Keep going. Charlie. All right, let's go. Westward movement, the manifest destiny. Americans they came up with this clause. A manifest destiny to occupy the continent. Uh, the early pioneers, Lewis and Clark, voyage of discovery, uh, set out. There were idealized notions of the West. Painters would, they began doing the Hudson Valley, River Valley, and then they started working on the West. And they would go out and make sketches and come back and do the enormous paintings. These are gigantic paintings. And you find these in the Museum of American Art in Washington. And they would actually charge people with pay to come see these. But they were idealized notions of the West. And they would, these are beautiful pictures, but <coughs> not realistic. They really, uh, obviously they were just, they weren't even done on site, they were just sketches. So. But people would see this and say, Oh, wow, that's, I, shit, let's go, you know. Uh, beginning the Western Movement began with the finding of the Cumberland Gap in uh, 1763, which enabled them, the people to get off the, the Piedmont and into the, what is called the Ohio country, um, which is occupied by the French and the Indians. And from there, that's when they get to the Mississippi, People, of course, would travel by wagon. Stories were told. Um, some, who knows what. Guys like you would tell stories, you know, and other people. Of course, the mountain men were the first one out there. The only thing in occupying the western part of the United States, uh, outside of Salt Lake City, were a few trading posts to the, the mountain men, and 350,000 Indians. And this is, uh, this was in Portland, this is the, uh, there's Sacagawea, um, Lewis and Clark, uh, looking over the passage to the west. Uh, the U.S. territories, how did we get a west? Just to refresh your mind, we had the Texas annexation, Louisiana Purchase, and the, we got the land from the Spanish, so they were in Cats that Purchase. You get some more water. Okay, this one you might want to look at. These were the wagon trails out west. You had the Oregon Trail, the Spanish Trail. Uh, you could see the Indian tribes in, in the unoccupied territory. And you can see that the Transcap would, would follow this middle path. That's, that's what they were going to use. Um, okay, the technically, if you want, I'm going to bring some ties into Chicago. The very first real transcontinental long railroad that set the model that they used, the business model they would say today, or the method for constructing railroads, was the Illinois Central. In 1850, it was the first land-grant railroad in the United States. Um, in 1850. Um, this set the pattern. There's some photos of the Illinois Central. Um, and again, that. That's Lincoln's train. Um, funeral train. This is the one out at, at Illinois Rail Museum, Illinois Central Engine. Something like that. Casey Jones was used. But anyhow, Giving, people don't know this, as many as 10,000 workers were engaged in building, building the, you don't have to read all this, I'll read it for you, 10,000, 1,000 mile, um, 700 mile road. And it was the longest at the time, it was the longest in the world. Um, ran down the length of the state from Chicago all the way um, to uh, the river. Okay, that set the pattern. It was done by the railroad. Now, 
Of course, in the meantime, after the Illinois Central was built, you've had interest in California. Gold was discovered. Guys like you went out there thinking you could, you know, and you can see here, you had to get there by steamship through Nicaragua. Another thing that connect, began connecting us to the West was the Telegraph Act of 1860 around this time. They have Telegraph connected, which of course put the Pony Express out of business. Um, uh, uh, within a, it only lasted 18 months. I believe you, in the Pony Express, they only hired orphans, right? Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Because you didn't think. <laughs> uh, all right, this is a. Uh, now, the other thing is when they were building a transcon, people don't know this, they also had a late telegraph line. The telegraph lines, as a matter of fact, always tried to keep ahead of the track crews in the track. Um, but uh, the, um, they also needed telegraph stations along the way every 20 miles. That's what I mean. There was a lot of infrastructure. We just think about track, but they had to do a lot more than that. Um, the other thing that took her on this time was Abraham Lincoln came up with the Homestead Act. Uh, you could get 160 acres for $10 if you lived on it for five years, or you could purchase it for a dollar and a quarter an acre. Uh, the, this was the same price used for the land given to the railroads to sell that they acquired in, in route uh, and by the government, get they 50 50. Um, but uh, this was the price the railroads had a year to, at least at the beginning. Uh, amazingly enough, 40, only less than 40% of the people that got land um, made it for the full five years. It was terrible terrain. You could run into inclement weather and what have you. Uh, and the other thing is, is that they, like greenhorns like you guys, would say, hey, let's go get some land. And you don't know anything about farming. You know, <laughs> you know even less. You know. So you'd get out there and you'd be like, hey, I don't know what to do. You know, this, this is too hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know. All right. So you can see again, it was used by the Northwestern. Uh, it came across this quote. Now, some guys realized what the West was like. And this one, one congressman said, the West, Western, beyond the Mississippi, he said, was a land no U.S. citizen should be compelled to inhabit except as punishment for crime. They thought it was the great American desert, and in many respects it was. You have long grass in the east, if you follow it through Ohio and Illinois, to the short grass of you have to get shorter in the Colorado, and it's like, you know, it's like in the in the in the east, you can have ten cows per acre, but when you get out west, I remember you had a ten acres for one cow. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, this is very serious. Uh, they also had some crazy notions. It used to be that rain follows the plow. Some guy actually came along and said, rain follows the track. And he actually had a thing, he said within, I think it was within eight days, if they built the railroad track, there'd be like some electronic disturbance. And even though it was really dry and desert-like, because they built a railroad track, it would start raining and become a very temperate climate, which needs to say didn't happen. But the reason the government was doing this, uh, they were land rich, but cash poor. And this way, it was a good idea uh, to the settlement. There you can see some of the sod, the sodies. Uh, now this guy, I like this picture, I really do. He's out there, he's got his pride possession. He's got his farm equipment. He had his shotgun on his shoulder. You know, so he's a, he's, he's a cool dude. There was also setting the framework, like, I'm trying to set, the, why did they undertake this project? Another one was, they also had a 500, in addition to the Illinois Central, there was a big project, was the Erie. Erie Railroad was 450 miles. 
and required some significant infrastructure. So they said they had some experience. They said, well, it worked for okay, the Erie right on the Albany on the Hudson River. Uh, so, I mean, it did play a background. That was in 1851. Also, what took place at this time, we're talking about advancing to the west, was that New York and Chicago were connected in 1853. And later on, there were four major railroads that offered service between New York and Chicago, and a fifth one that you juggle around and made transfers and so forth. But, um, and modern bringing you up to date. There's some literature in the back, and I recommend looking up the website of the New York and Chicago High Speed Railroad. Uh, another guy that worked on the connecting Chicago, does anybody know? Yeah, there you go. There's Grandpa. That's my great-grandpa. Right here. This guy. They had to hold them up, right? Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. That's his great-grandfather. Jonathan's grandfather. Five-star presentation. Yeah. He, he's a, he, he's a, he's a real old tycoon. Not, like his grandson. Uh, all right, finally they came around. Congress and Abe Lincoln, who liked railroads, was a railroad lawyer. And they passed in Congress the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862 and underwent several amendments. Um, and it was said across the continent, westward the course of empire takes its way. They really believed this was going to make the United States like one mega country, make America great, not again, but for the first time, and take its place as the number one notion. They had really some notion. crazy things. Uh, there you see a handshake. This is from a banner, one of their, when they opened it, they had this handshake. And the only thing was, in a way, as I mentioned, there were two tribes in particular uh, that the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851 said, you guys, wait a minute, you gave us the land, and the land belonging to seven of the Plains Indians, or the horse cultures. Uh, but I guess when you write a treaty, you can also write an escape clause in it. So these were subsequently, one reason or another, annulled. I did not read them, but I assure you, if they wrote it, they went and having written this stuff for years, you put one of those in there, and if you don't catch it, yeah, they, they had that in there. There you can see how the Indians are tearing up good American-made railroad there, burning it, setting it on fire. Look at that. Terrible. <laughs> Look at here's more. Look at that. Look at those guys, they're just trying to go to work. And they gotta fight off Indians, you know. Riding, riding the... And, of course, there were the decimation of the buffalo, tragically, herds of 12 million uh, in the plains, which were uh, used for food and route by the wagon train settlers and the core of the horse culture. Uh, there was, however, one tribe, the Pawnees, which got along with the U.S. government, and they agreed to serve as protectors. Again, you could see what these Indians do to trade. Look at, they just wrecked it, and then looking for stuff they could steal. Yeah, look at that. All right, there's the Pawnees getting a free ride on the Leavenworth Pawnee and Western. Um, Okay, the only other people in addition to the Indians, the Mormons did object to the railroad, uh, not very seriously because they later worked on it, but they believed that the railroad would encroach on the character of their society and bring undesirables to their, like, yeah, bumps, hobos, they were right. Yeah, I got you. The first train probably left the station, there was a hobo one. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, the government, as I said, was supported by the United States government, in particular in the person of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Can you see where he is in this photo? No. There's all Abe, right up by the window. Abraham Lincoln, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's on his way to ostensibly get the Gettysburg Address. I've been there in Hancock, Maryland. Uh, okay, what was the deal for building the railroad? Don't read all this. Basically, they got a 400 foot right away. Uh, they, were, they got land grants of 10 square miles for each mile of track, alternating checkerboard with the government. Um, they also had rights of timber and stone uh, on the land. So they got a lot of land. Altogether, 21 million acres when they were done. Uh, they got, this is like an entitlement or a bonds. They got paid in three ways, either 16,000 per mile, uh, 32 or 48, depending on the terrain. Uh, and they had 15 years to complete the railroad. Now what I mean by they is, um, they actually set up two companies. We'll go a little further into that later. The Union Pacific and the West and the Central Pacific. And they actually met in Chicago, Illinois, 163 businessmen. And they put together the Union Pacific Railroad. On the other coast, the Central Pacific was put together by four businessmen called the Big Four. So you had two companies they were put together and they were going to compete in building the railroad. Um, but that's basically it. Uh, the other thing about I'd like to mention about building this land as an incentive for railroad is that they, have, as a result, the railroads and surveyors didn't always follow the shortest route. And they took contour lines. And there, this happened. Believe me, they even took bends in some places for no reason. But they added a lot of land. And so there were state class workers. Um, I, one other story is the Central Pacific Railroad had the boundary of the Sierra Mountains moved. They had a geologist that said, no, they're they're 15 miles closer to Sacramento. That's mountains, that's not plains. It's pancake flat land. But the government didn't check it, and so they approved it as mountain railroad. They got 48,000. They had a geologist who wrote letters and said, oh no, the, the mountains begin here, you know, not there. And, you know, but, um, could talk about, yeah, the, Capitalist, fascist, Wall Street money mongers. They set up a phony company. Credit Mobilier was a an infrastructure company in France. They just used the name to look like they were the same company. They set this up, and this, how can I say? They had a Union Pacific Railroad, and then the Credit Mobilier did all the work. But the same guys who ran the Union Pacific were also the same guys who ran this company. So they would, whatever credit mobile they built the Union Pacific, Union Pacific would pay. But they were paying themselves. I don't know how to explain that. They were two companies in essence comprised of the same guy. So the credit mobile would bill they would say, they were charging, to give you an example, Credit Mobile would charge, was building a railroad at $50,000 a mile. One guy said, there is no way the cost of a railroad in this terrain should be more than twenty or $30,000 that the Union Pacific was paying for. It. And because they, they approved the bill, it's all right. But uh, for a while they weren't building anything. Uh, this is just talks about the land that they had millions of acres. 
to dispose of. Uh, there's a lot been done about, I don't want to get into the issue of land grants. We'd be here all night. It was an issue in the 1872, I believe, in presidential campaign. This map is a phony. It's campaign propaganda. If you see these maps in history books, don't believe any of it. That there's, they don't, people don't realize this. Here's one of the brochures. This is fake news from the 19th century, <laughs> honestly. And it shows up in history books and arch conservatives and libertarians and they don't know what they're talking about and it's filmed, that's what I mean. They'll take a map like this, cut it out, they don't realize that it's a campaign poster. All right, now we're gonna build the railroad, finally. There you can see us building a railroad. Take a look down here at the bottom and you'll see rifles because this is a photo of the um, Union Pacific going west. Union Pacific goes west. Central Pacific is building east. Uh, you can all, there's other things I can tell that this is a Western Pacific photo by the ties, but um, you can see they had, it got so the Indians attacked, they were told to have weapons on their person or already at all times. Their, the original plan, there were a couple plans dating back uh, to the 1850s, 30s, originally starting from Chicago. That, this is all it says. Many, uh, that was the original idea. Um, Isaac Whitney's not giving much credit. In the, set, in the West Coast, the guy that was behind it became known as Crazy Judah because that's all they could talk about was building a railroad. He was a railroad engineer. He went to Congress, persuaded Congress. He had a map of the route, the railroad that was 60 feet long, uh, and he talked to the congressman for passage of there's the Pacific Railway Act. There you see the big four, who were four merchants, retail merchants in Sacramento. They were dry. Actually, one of them, C.P. Huntington, and amazingly, he went out there to dig for gold. He worked one morning in the gold field and said, to heck with this. <laughs> he quit and opened the, they supplied tools to the mines. But these guys were all tied into the Comstock load, which was on the other side of the Sierras. So they, uh, and um, those, they're known as the Big Four, Leland Stanford of the <coughs> university was named after. He was governor, or actually became governor, Mark Hopkins and um, Charles Cracker. But great, uh, Judah, Judah is the guy that is attributed. He marketed it, the idea in Congress and around the United States for years. He was later, once they were done with him, he was kicked out. In the Union Pacific, they, Lincoln's friend, they had their own engineers. This guy was a general in the ar army. Granville Dodge um, was the foremost railroad engineer in the East, chosen by the Union Pacific, and in their business was run by a fellow called Thomas Durant. And Durant is the most ruthless capitalist that ever lived in the history of mankind. He cared nothing about building a railroad. He cared only about making money in any way, shape, or form. This guy was intense. <laughs> but, um, all right, two guys, they had construction bosses. I just wanted to point out uh, Jack, Jack Casement. You can see here he was a Cossack. They told him to be in charge of the men. And in his photograph here, he's carrying a whip. And the other guy allegedly carried a, a wooden axe handle. I don't think he ever used it. But I came across this butler in a kid composition. They're talking about Jack Caseman and his workers. But he said the Irish laborers were unreliable, drank a lot of whiskey. They worked only until the next payday. <laughs> this was in a student. They turn up, speed it up. The Irish are smarter than churn up. Uh, there you can see they they had all sorts of dignitaries they'd bring out. They had flush cars. 
and they'd have parties. You can see the railroads moving uh, west. There's uh, the movement of the building of railroad track in the United States. In particular, you can see a gap in the southern there, the mountains. But it was it, the time has come. They're crossing the, the Mississippi and headed towards the Missouri. Okay, and there you can see that is the route of the Transcon itself. Uh, this is another part of the Transcon called the Kansas Pacific Railroad. Um, okay, to bring you up to date, just to show you, getting to the West Coast is not easy. Even today, there are a minimal number of routes. You have the Santa Fe down southwest, um, Southern Pacific, way down south. They are identified by parallels. There's 39 parallel 48. There are all sorts of disputes about which route to use. Um, that's what I mean. Everybody and their brother was arguing whether it should be in Chicago or Duluth, Omaha, Council Bluffs, Kansas City, um, what have you. But those are the current routes today. There's another one of these. You can see there really aren't a multitude of ways. It is tough terrain. And last in Tanner was in 1909, the Milwaukee Road uh, went to the West Coast. They were the last ones to show up. That's what we're going to be talking about. There's the final line to the West Coast. They sent two Ford photographers along to, to stir up investments. We don't need to get into that. What did they actually build? In the West, uh, they went a thousand miles west and they came 690 miles east to meet. Uh, they had a road bed of three foot or so high. I don't know about that. It was 400 rails per mile using 2,500 wooden ties with 10 spikes. They would put down a rail every 30 seconds. They had guys, crews of about five guys, pick up a rail, one guy would say down, and like when they were really, they had the contest later on, we'll talk about, they were laying about rails about as fast as you could, a man could walk. Now that was really moving. And usually the, they started each day, we'll see, with enough for about one mile to two uh, each day. These are actual photos at Sacramento, where they had staging areas. Omaha, Sacramento, enormous quantities of supplies, rail, things they call fish plates for connecting, um, ties, um, tools. That Sacramento again came up from scratch. They even built roundhouses, because these were real railroads. There I told you about water. There's the tub cars. Each day they had to send these out. Uh, for, now, now when you build a railroad, the first guys to do it are the surveyors that choose the route. Um, this is what uh, Crazy Judah um, was. He made 23 trips through the Sierra mountains he was unable to locate a route until somebody contacted him and uh, Theodore Judah was his name um, he, he wrote him and he said I think I found a route a guy lived in, in Donner's Pass and he said I think I found it normally when you the problem I had you come in you go up and down mountains but this way they went up one mountain and there was a plain a plateau and then it went straight down and that's why they were able to they were going to circle the whole mountain range because they just thought it was impassable. The mountains range from 7,000 to 14,000 feet. Um, but some guy wrote, a guy wrote, and, and later on they, we'll see, they built a, there you can see the surveyors. Um, Granville Dodge did the other part of the country on his own. He went out there, it was hostile Indian country. But he was planning, that's what I mean. He says, now if you look at these photos, this is, we'll see about the snow later on, but you see that the tops of those trees, 
the reason they claim that those trees were cut by the Donner Party that was trapped there. And that's how deep the snow was. And they trapped these trees. That's, and that, that's absolutely true. The snow is like that. Um, so this is what they added, they were looking towards. How do you find a route through there? Also, if you have woods, you got to blast those trees out of the way. The high tech boys had come along. They had to build 15 tunnels on, on the western part, four tunnels on the, uh, on the eastern part of the railroad. And um, this is what I mean. They found a trail and they made it a wagon trail. Uh, this is actually the railroad was operating this, um, but they used it during the building of the railroad, uh, the Dutch Flat Wagon Road. Okay, there are some, now I see some photos. There's some of the, your, your Irishmen, hard-working Irishmen, working on the railroad. There's another one of them. They're tough guys. These guys, you know, you don't want to mess with these guys. Now they constructed work trains. Work trains with bunk houses on them, five tiers of bunks, 50 men or so. They had 20 car trains with blacksmiths, an armory with rifles and guns, uh, a luncheon, uh, all sorts of trades and crafts, tool car, but 20 car trains, they push it down the line, a couple engines. Just some guys out there, flat cars, rail 39 feet long, rails, uh, 60 to 65 pounds per yard, 650 yards per rail, and some guys taking a ride. There you can see the Indians. These are peaceful, good behaving Pawnee Indians. And there you can see there's the construction uh, work train. Uh, this is, uh, again, we see that photo of the uh, Union Pacific. Uh, it took 40, 40 flatbed cars we just saw of material to build one track of, of one mile of track. And you can see the flat cars and the 440. I told you earlier, there's the turntables that they had en route uh, on this train. Uh, there's just some guys coming out of the tunnel. Uh, this is just some trains at work. Um, each day began, as I said, they, were, they had to have supplies. They planned at at least a mile or two. This is an interesting, there you see a supply cart in the circle. And what these guys are actually doing is bending a rail for around the curb. And they would just put it between some ties and stand on it. Or hit it with a hammer six or eight times. That's how you curve rail. Okay, that's a track game. And that all worked and no play. Um, they had these towns that moved along with the trains called the Hell on Wheels. And there were tent cities, as many as 3,000 people, with taverns and liquor and, and places where they could whoop it up and have a good time. Which this is run by guys out of Chicago. Um, but this is, this is one tent city. And as I say, 3,000 people with 25 saloons and five dance halls. I would have gone there. It sounds like cool, man. It's like Vegas on wheels. It was great. But one guy said, I like this. He said there was bison crying stocks unblushingly in the midday sun. Even during the day, they were sitting and they had hurdy gurdy girls. Like, <laughs> what other hours? All right. Well, we got to move. He says 10 miles. What time is it, Timmy? It's uh, about five eight to minutes to uh, nine. Eight. That's about us. Uh, eight minutes to eight. Yeah, eight minutes. All right. To eight. Just uh, we'll get through the Chinese called Celestials. They were about 60,000 in in California to begin with. Um, the uh, they put them on a trial basis. 
It worked out fine. Okay, they got paid about a dollar a day. Um, they actually went on strike one time unsuccessfully. They were notorious for drinking boiled tea and therefore not coming down with things like dysentery. They also took a daily bath, which the other the Irishmen didn't do. Uh, they also were notorious. They ate, they ran in groups. They had one translator and they would pay a cook and they would have a really sumptuous banquet with imported foods every Sunday. Whereas the Irish men would generally have boiled beans or some kind of boiled stuff, beef. Um, there you can see more Chinese workers. Uh, there you can see a guy with tea, they use powder. The last thing I'll be done with, special challenges were the uh, storms and the tunnels. They had to use five blasting powder. They used for both for grading the land and for the tunneling. Uh, nitroglycerin was too dangerous. There's monuments to them. There you can see, this is the other thing. In order to blast through granite to make a tunnel, you have one guy who has a chisel, or a shaker they called it, and he held the chisel or drill. And the other guy would hammer it. And then he'd spin the drill. And and you keep going until you had it. You had to go down about one foot, about an inch, fill it with black powder or nitro, light it, and run. And nitro is simply too dangerous. They gave up on it. They had a ship that blew up and killed 50 people in San Francisco. It was against the law to transport it. You could make it, but you had to be made on site. Black powder they used seriously. They used more black powder than they used in Civil War battles. They would get maybe eight. Eight inches, seven to eight inches per day. And they had to get the longest tunnel, summit tunnel, was 1,600 feet, 1,640 feet at eight inches a day. Uh, you can see the embankment, uh, monuments to the, there's the caves. They didn't need to be braced because they were solid already. The granite, um, they had a boss translator. This is uh, Utah. Uh, the other thing you have to do on railroads, you cut or you fill. There's a fill. You got it inside a trestle. There's a cut. There's a cut. That's Loomer's cut, 800 feet long. You had to dig that out, blast that out. Okay, there's some Chinamen taking a ride. Uh, trestles. Uh, the only thing is, Interesting about trestles are they built one, three of them fell down before a train rolled, rolled over it. <laughs> they built pretty flimsy. Uh, this is a famous one. There's another one you can see. This one, they actually tried prefabricating one in Chicago uh, and shipped it out there and constructed it on site later, made them out of metal. And finally, they needed a bridge across the Missouri um, to connect, to really make it a transcontinental railroad. Snow sheds, they were snowed in. They had something like 44 storms one winter. Snows would be 15 to 50 feet deep. They actually dig tunnels under the snow and worked in, in that capacity. They ended up building these snow sheds. Uh, there were avalanches, old trains went off the mountain and their snow plows had 30 foot snow plow. They had, they had to use pig iron. They have like a dozen engines to get through the snow. This is modern equipment. In the 50s they had a train that got stranded. Still, they, that's what I mean, you can see the snow there. This is what they use today, jet engines. Uh, Mormons worked for it. They're, they're, that's what I mean. The Mormons came along later at a thousand mile mark, and allegedly the Mormons got cheated. They never got paid. Um, finally, we're done, and there's a celebration. Uh, work crews hamled in. Here's they ran 680 thousand rails and four and a quarter million ties at three strikes per strike. Swipe. 
20.4 million hits with a sledgehammer. And there's the golden spike. There were three of them. Um, well, two gold, one silver, and one of the regular metal, which has since disappeared. Monument to the Chinese in California. They later passed the law in gratitude, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 82. Another monument I came across in, in uh, Arizona, Flagstaff to the great, a trip. We'll just go real quickly through this. We'll be done to California. Now I showed this one because I'm a big shot railroad guy and this is a free pass issued by the president of the railroad, the Union Pacific, and there's a free pass for me issued by the Central Pacific. To show you how this is big. <laughs> there's guides, they look at, they thought they'd go to Europe. There are all sorts of always guides to the United States. These are actual photos of engines out on the line. Big boys later on came along, large steam engines in operation, or so they claimed in the United States, used along the line because they had one and a half uh, percent grade, later Union Pacific equipment. This is Omaha Yards today, North Platte, Nebraska, largest rail terminal in the world. And there you can see, look at that, coal. Uh, Feather River, Colorado, Wyoming. North Platte, the Lucerne cutoff. They actually went straight across the shortcut they wanted. It took too long, so they cut right across the Great Salt Lake. There's a trestle right across the middle of it. Sacramento, and we're in San Francisco. There's Oakland, uh, and they have, this is the hotel I stayed in. Oops in Oakland, where the trains come right, literally through the, almost through the hotel. You can walk right out, that's what I mean. I was looking over the balcony, and there was a train street running right through it. And that's it, thank you very much. And up, boy. It's the top spot in my mind. All right, all right. All Let's right. go question, quick. We only got about five. We, we got time. Forty-five minutes. Yeah, come on. Questions? Is Electromotive still making uh, engines? Uh, as far as I know, not really. Not really? Press the top button on your remote so we can turn off the projector. What? The top button on your remote. The top one. Yeah. Press it. Why? Because it'll turn off the image. There. Oh, uh, uh, he's talking about electromotive division, um, which made the diesel engine, and um, they uh, have been taken over by uh, General Electric. General and Motors. General Electric is now the primary manufacturer there. of, um, uh, I don't know what the status of the company is. They moved from here to Canada. From my understanding, they've not been selling all the models. Next. Yeah. Yeah. What was the average wage uh, of an ordinary laborer uh, on the. Uh, on the Central Pacific, you could safely say about a dollar a day. Which was good money for that time. Yes. And now, on the other one, Union Pacific, I get figures of $250 to $4. Now, because they were under investigation, some of the records of that nature wasn't preserved. I wish, let's pay attention it to that. It disappeared. <coughs> yeah, so, but that's the figures I'm given. Uh, uh, $35 a month, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um. You haven't talked about this. Um, what about the magnetic trains? I've heard about um, magnetic trains. Maglev? What? Maglev trains. Yes, exactly. What yeah, they're really, they're them? really cool. They're working on one in China. They are the cutting edge, state of the art. They actually only turn on where the train is and they turn off, which is the unique feature. 
if you can imagine that. But uh, it's wheelless transport. The, that's what I mean. Um, it, it's, it's high tech. Uh, there's only one, and I don't believe it's fully operational. Why, why aren't we building it here? That's a Cost very good much question. Money. Last week was infrastructure week, and the United States has not had an infrastructure plan for under the Trump administration at all for any kind of transportation, even buses, trains, nothing. We can't even keep Amtrak. And it's a matter of priorities. Um, they, that's what I mean. I'm going to Washington next week to talk about transportation, but the we can't support our existing systems, let alone going to some high tech. That's just I you know you get Republicans in there. Believe me, I was in the transportation committee run by the Republicans. They have public-private partnerships, and oh, we don't. Want, Republicans do not want to spend a dollar on anything. Would, would that be a greener technology? Oh yes, yeah. it's all electric. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, all right. Seeing as how we don't have any. Yeah. What are we talking about? Um, I just heard from my friend that uh, Jefferson Davis was considered the father of Chicago railroads because he was the one who persuaded the railroads to go through Chicago instead of Kansas City. Uh, Jefferson D Davis is the person I'm talking about. Uh, the only thing I can tell you was that the business interests in Chicago, I basically enough, were opposed to railroads. <laughs> they thought it would, for various reasons, be detrimental to the businesses and now Jefferson Davis was Secretary of War and he he was in charge of the studies for the Transcontinental Railroad in 53 and 55. I've Under seen what his, president? Huh? Under what president? Buchanan. Oh. Now he was, and I've seen this, they did extensive studies. I mentioned the different parallel routes of uh, 38th parallel, 42nd. And his thing, the only thing I can recollect was that he just wanted the railroad to begin in Georgia. And I don't think he had any anything to do with. I'm rather surprised. I don't think he had anything to do with, with Chicago. But I could say it correctly. All right. Yeah, Andy. Charlie, uh, did you get any information at all on the new uh, solar powered electric trains that they're building around the world? Uh, the There's the only diesel. one experimental. Where was that? Australia. And that was some individuals. There's no solar power trains. Okay. Thank uh, you. Well, there's some guys got, X is kind of a neat story. Uh, they got used equipment. They put solar panels on it. But that was about a year ago, and I haven't heard anything. They were running. There's no... There's no solar power train. That's what I was asking the solar guys. Can, how much solar? Can, we had a guy that, we, that had a plan for doing the whole country using both solar power trains, but there's nothing operational and nothing planned, is that I'm aware of. All right? You'd be better off using a thorium-powered locomotive. All right, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, easy, easy. Oh, you got a question? I yeah. cut you off. No, let's let's. No, uh, no, let's wait. A quick, uh, quick question: question. Uh, uh, Jefferson was Davis was he not was he not also the uh, guy that came up with the idea of uh, using uh, camels for the army? Yes, uh, I was. <laughs> I don't know. You, you tell us. All right, thank you very much. All right, let's get in a question time. Andy, can you take care of it, please? All right, thank you. Hope you learned something. All right, how many more? Pay, how many buddy have rebuttals? bottles? Can you, can you get up there and? Just take a count for us. How many people are having rebuttals? 
That's one, two, three, four, five. <coughs> Any more rebuttals? Just five people. Okay. All right, we'll go about four minutes apiece. Let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, well, uh, when I read about the uh, Transcontinental Railroad, at, far, at first they had people who spoke English, like you said, Irishman, Englishman, or any type of uh, um, any type of person that came to the United States. Well, they had a good job making the Intercontinental Railroad. Then what happened was Sutter. There's a street named after him in San Francisco. On Sutter's way, and they found gold. <coughs> when they found gold, all of a sudden, maybe three quarters of people just disappeared and went to um, to find gold. They weren't interested in working if they could get gold and get rich. So they ran away. So what happened was they figured they got to have somebody there that doesn't understand English and could work very hard and with very little food. So they sent um, they sent for Chinese. Chinese could live on a bowl of rice for a day and work very hard and understand one word of English. And they're the ones that mostly built the Transcontinental Railroad in the, in the West. So that's that's one of the um, reasons that you have so many um, Chinese in San Francisco. It has the biggest Chinese colony of any uh, city in the United States. Then, of course, once they built the railroads, they wanted to get rid of the buffalo because they wanted to get rid of the Indians. So what they done is they got people to sit on the railroads that are sharpshooters, and they went with the uh, railroad through the, through the plains, and they were doing is killing buffalo. The killing buffalo, of course, the Indians, because the Indians, their whole uh, substance, their whole way of life was based on buffalo. For instance, they ate the buffalo, they made tents out of the buffalo, they take the uh, bones and made uh, bow and arrows out of the buffalo, they took the sinews and made it to sew things. So the whole way of life was based on the buffalo. And that's one of the reasons that they got rid of all the Indians. And then, of course, yeah. the, uh, what happened once the railroads were built to a certain degree, and what happened was that the government paid a lot of these railroad companies to build railroads. So what did they do? They took the money and they built the railroad to nowhere. And they got paid for it. So it wasn't going anywhere. It's just a, a, a few people were making tremendous amounts of money off the railroads. Another thing is, they, once they found oil, and uh, they needed oil for transportation and things of that nature, because they stopped using uh, uh, what was it, uh, animals from the sea to get their oil. So what they done is the Rockefellers bought up most of the railroads. And if you wanted to uh, ship anything, you had to go to the Rockefeller family I call them the rotten smellers. That's what the real name is. <laughs> so, so the rotten, rotten smellers made tremendous amount of money and cornered the railroad market, and you had monopolies. So once you had monopolies, all of a sudden you needed uh, you, you needed somewhere where you could sell your goods. So that's the that's the beginning of monopolies in the United States, and that's the beginning of the First World War and the Second World War. It was also all based on the uh, monopolies controlling almost everything in the United States. And now you have about three people that own half the wealth in the United States. Everything is so monopolized. Of course, Jeff Bezos seconds. and Warren Buffett and uh, Gates have half the wealth of the United States. So we're coming to a point where this can keep going. And I think eventually there's going to be a downturn in the economy. And then who knows what will happen, but I think we're going to go to a better system than we have now. Next. All right, next, please. Beauty before. Uh, 
I'm not going to take very long because um, uh, I don't know very much. But uh, I was I was born in California, and my family was there. And uh, one day we were slogging around the um, cemetery in at Marysville, California, looking for my relatives' <laughs> graves, and. Uh, I noticed that there was a Chinese section in the cemetery. So the Chinese didn't have a separate section. They had a, a separate cemetery. They had a separate section in the cemetery uh, around Marysville. And uh, it was interesting to me because the Catholic cemetery was across the street. They had a separate cemetery. And um, there was a, a very, there was an interesting uh, saying among my relatives that uh, so-and-so doesn't have a Chinaman's chance. Because you saw those Chinamen on, on the edge of the cliff doing that um, uh, explosion thing. And uh, not only that, the, China, the Chinese people expected, I, I don't know, can you say they expected this? That they were hired on the railroad to work until they died. And then they replaced them with another one. And I think the Chinese people knew that was the drill. I, I don't know, but anyway, the Chinese people were worked so hard on this railroad that they died like crazy. And um, that was where the expression came, uh, so-and-so doesn't have a Chinese chance. But anyway, um, I also had a cousin-in-law who was obsessed with the railroad up Mount Tamalpai that came down into No Valley. Uh, it went from Mill Valley up to Mount Tamalpai, and his wife, who was my cousin, was driven crazy because every time they had guests or anything, he would monopolize the entire evening talking about that railroad. Alright, All right, next. Thank you. Jonathan, four minutes. We work, we volunteer, we organize for safe, green energy powered, fully accessible, high quality, affordable public rail transportation. We advocate for better stations, stops, routes, public transit services, including full funding for elevators, crosswalks, canopies, benches, sidewalks, curb cuts, schedules, restrooms, overhead heat grids, garbage cans and recycling cans. We are passengers, operators, mechanics, workers, students, family members, community members, and pay docs. Together <laughs> our call to action is we're on our way to a really good day. Next stop, high speed rail. Uh, this is from uh, Bill Ayer's book, Demand the Impossible. Uh, this is the chapter, Shoulders to the Wheel. There is little or no consideration for the greater good in the approach beyond a kind of orthodoxy that the market is natural, inevitable, and entirely wise, and that it exists, therefore, automatically for the greater good. This is entirely fact-free and faith-based dogma, but it's trotted out on every occasion to dress up in colorful clothing the relentless drive for cheap resources and cheap labor, maximum profit, and minimum cost. Automobiles and oil and highways are made to seem normal and rational as the chief means of moving from place to place without any alternative whatsoever. But if the opening question were a consideration of the best types of tra transportation, various forms that fit the needs of people and do minimum harm to the earth, an imaginative world opens up and we begin to see lots and lots of alternatives. Technological innovations will be worthy then, redirected away from producing super profits for a few and super exploited labor for the many and toward meeting people's needs while eliminating exploitation and galloping consumerism altogether. A modest use of resources is preferable to an excessive use since resources are everywhere limited. And as E.F. Schumacher, the economist, <laughs> argues in his classic book, Small is Beautiful, people who live in highly self-sufficient local communities are less likely to get involved in large-scale violence 
than people whose existence depends on worldwide systems of trade. We might advocate then never taking a ride even on public transportation on nice days when we can walk or ride a bicycle instead. We are now explicitly speaking in a different register. Values, ethics, politics, human purposes, and real choice. That's by Bill Ayers and Demand the Impossible. Great book. Um, I got a job in 2010 by accident. Uh, I met Larry. Many of you know Larry. He's in the back there. Uh, he's the very good looking Italian man with the uh, wheels that he likes to bring with him. Uh, and I had enough money to actually go on a vacation, which is a rare thing when you've made less than $16,000 on average your entire career as a social worker in a state that pretty much tells you that you shouldn't be here. So I decided one to go minute. for the first time, one minute, I, I decided to go on the train out west to California for the first time in my life because I'd never been there and I didn't want to take the car and I didn't want to take the airplane. I wanted to take, as a great grandson of a railroad worker who worked on the south side of Chicago, the train. And this is what I came up with. Shapes of desert hills traced by sunrise, faces canyon tops graced by stone and snow pines, landscapes of beauty fill this place of giant size. At the base of towering rock, today's dawn and horses run wild. We take this path until the rays of winter's sky are replaced by house neons awake on westbound line. Fresh paint of clouds of silk, train brings this dream to life. No way the song could not join Paige without this ride. To San Jose from Shy, then back home again on Old Lang Syne. Back home again on Old Lang Syne. I've got a movie for you, Charlie. It's by Howard Zinn. It's called You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. And I made a little bookshelf that looks like a golden spike for you as well. You can keep your collection of books, CDs, DVDs, and uh, okay. Bohemian poetry. All right. Good talk. Next. Next. Do they have that in the, uh, Next. I think they do. I think they do. Four minutes. I'll, I'll give you a copy. Okay, uh, I, I, I really like this speech tonight. So, so much, an incredible amount of information. So I'm really impressed by uh, Charlie's depth of knowledge on the topic. But I actually do have a rebuttal. Ah. Uh, Charlie had mentioned that uh, magnetic trains are, uh, are green, or maybe he just uh, affirmed it when somebody mentioned that they were green. And this is just a pet peeve of mine. Uh, a lot of people I bump into, they talk about how they have an electric car, and electric cars are really important because it's green energy, electricity, green energy. Well, uh, it might seem green, on, on appearance because they're not generating pollutants in your face as they drive by you. But, uh, but the electricity comes from somewhere. And in this state, we got uh, three sources of, uh, three types of energy that makes electricity, the gas, the coal, and the nukes. And uh, so when you're driving a car, you're not just plugging your car into the wall socket, you're actually plugging it into one of those reactors. And so um, if you're driving an electric car that gets charged up, you're actually driving on a, a nuclear car in one respect. So uh, keep that in mind. But that's a very, very minor issue, and I just love Charlie's talk. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, uh, a lot of people have a tremendous amount of empathy nowadays for uh, for Muslims and how they're they're treated horribly in this country by uh, by other certain people. And um, about a, a, over a hundred years ago, uh, that ethnic group that was treated like that were the Chinese. Uh, they were invited to this country uh, for the simple purpose that. Uh, they literally couldn't find Americans to do the work. It was so damn incredibly dangerous. They couldn't find Americans to do the work. They would just leave. And they found the Chinese. They came over here. It's a huge contribution of uh, Chinese Americans to uh, building of the transcontinental railroad. And it made me think of something that was kind of funny I thought I'd share with you. I have a friend who was born in China. And I was saying, you know, when, a, when an ethnic group uh, comes into this country, they bring their culture, and, and one sign of that is the language. There's usually some words and vocabulary that's rooted in that ethnic group. And he was like, well, give me an example. And I had to think about it. I wasn't sure. So he went to Google, 
and I thought of, uh, I found a great word that I had no idea where it came from. Ketchup. Ketchup is from the Chinese. It's, uh, it's it, the, the original uh, pronunciation, I don't know, but it's just like tomato sauce. So uh, it's just a sign of uh, the Chinese culture. So I thought I'd share that. Okay. Next. All right. I like American food. Okay, this isn't so much of a uh, rebuttal, but uh, Charlie, you may be able to uh, shed some light on this. Um, for a long time, I've wondered, given the fact that in the 1860s, Chicago was, of course, uh, the major meatpacking uh, uh, part of the country. It was also an important railroad center. And at the time of the Civil War, I often wondered why the Confederacy never dispatched maybe 15 men to Chicago to blow up the railroad tracks, turn the cattle loose on the city. Uh, that would have done a lot for feeding a lot of people who might not have had a recent you know, meal. And uh, at the same time, uh, created enough chaos in the North that uh, they surely would have been looking for negotiations. Just a thought. But I'm just kind of wondering how the Confederate cabinet, which was composed of some very smart people, uh, didn't think of this and didn't think of sending people to do this when they had sent uh, an expedition of people up in Vermont uh, to do fifth column work behind the uh, northern lines and uh, why there had been a plot, at least one plot, to free the prisoners at Camp Douglas uh, at Rock Island, which is where they kept the officers, uh, and uh, turn them loose. Uh, just a thought, but uh, if uh, you're a Civil War buff as well as a uh, railroad buff, you might have some thoughts on that, and uh, maybe you can uh, enlighten me. Thank you. Next. question that Patrick raised. I don't remember all the details, but that was why they were going to free, try and free the prisoners at Camp Douglas, to cause general destruction to have them run amok here in Chicago. And by putting a stop to that, they nipped that in the butt. So that's why that didn't happen here. And the rain in Vermont was a minor nuisance. I mean, yeah, they burned down St. Albans and they stole a lot of money, but that's all they did. Um, they also tried to set fire to New York, but that didn't work out any too well in there. Uh, with regard to Charlie showing the slide, the 999, that's the locomotive's proper name. The Empire State Express was the name of the train that it was employed. But yes, you're right, it did set, set the, the, the land speed record that you said that it did, and the British still are denying it just like you said. Why the British still deny it, God only knows. But then. Nobody told them to occupy Ireland either, so. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and finally, um, uh, Jefferson Davis served as Secretary of War, not under Buchanan, but under Buchanan's predecessor, Franklin Pierce. And it was under President Pierce that um, Davis did, did all the railroad, or did some of the railroad survey work in terms of establishing the routes and what went where. And it was also Davis whose idea it was to bring import camels into this country as pack animals. Um, that didn't work out any too well when the Civil War started. There was nobody to tend the camels and they were just left over in the desert. Their descendants, incidentally, you, there have been sightings of camels in recent years in the desert. The yeah. American desert. Yeah, I know some of them even voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> okay, next. Next. All right, we got one more. You guys with this transcontinental railroad, as far as I'm concerned, 
can uh, basically stuff it. For me, the greatest transcontinental act was passed in 1956, called the Eisenhower Interstate and Defense Highways Act. The greatest civil construction project in the world, where you could go in, drive your own car, drive yourself, no schedules, and cross this country in days. It may have taken, you were still at the mercy of the railroads, the corporations, but by God, nothing will be a good road trip on right? a cold and interstate in the middle of the country. By God, Rockford, Ottawa, and you can see Henry Ford, the great open highway is one of the greatest thing of the American inventions. So the heck with the Transcontinental Railroad. I think the best thing that ever happened to this country was the Eisenhower Interstate Highway and Defense Highways Act. And uh, trucks are a little better than trains. They can go anywhere, be unloaded anywhere. And with containerized shipping, boy, it works like a charm. Thank you. All right, Charlie, get your rebuttal in. Hi, quickly, how much time we got? We got, uh, it's 8.23 uh, right now, Charlie. Oh, we got a few minutes. All right, regarding the labor, labor issue here, the <laughs> Union Pacific employed Civil War veterans. Um, yeah. the, the construction began actually in 1865. Um, these guys had military training yeah. and discipline suited to this type of activity. And, and certainly in defending themselves against the attacks of the bloodthirsty savages who were trying to stop this project. Uh, the Chinese, as I said, they, at the time there were 60,000 indigenous Chinese in California. They had, had problems on the side of you didn't get to read it, in the south, East China Kundung province and turmoil there and floods and political disturbances. Um, they had a reason to leave China. Um, the railroad printed up flyers 5,000 and after they had them on a, a, a certain workforce they actually recruited them. The Chinese also were not permitted or excluded from working themselves in the gold field. Now, in the West, the, they had difficulty recruiting because everyone wanted to get to the Comstock silver activities and maybe didn't want to have to work they'd rather work closer to home or something, get a job like that. Because they had to live on site. And what they, they, the regular, if you wish, the white Caucasians would do, is sign on to the railroad, get a free trip up the mountain, work a week, and then go, go looking for minerals. The Chinese were excluded from, from doing that. The other thing about life um, in studying this, they did not regard dying on the job the way we do. It just was a, a part of life. I really learned that, I'm serious. They didn't think, it, it, it just was something that happened, and or didn't happen. Um, the Chinese, you mentioned cemeteries, the, the railroad guarantee that uh, from what I understand, their bodies would be sent back to China in coffins, and apparently there are records of a uh, 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 freight train transporting them back. They did honor that, apparently, and returned the ones there. Now, the hazards were all over the place, equally shared um, by all constructed I if the Chinese wish to take special on this that's fine with me um, 
the all around them is hazardous. Um, perhaps in the West, no one knows what the exact toll was. No one has any figures of what the what 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 happened. So, but the, there were things dangerous on both sides, and anything. It's hazardous work. Come on, they were they were working quickly, under speed, uh, speeding up, uh, even in lane track. Things can happen, wheels break. Railroading is a very dangerous activity today under the best circumstances. I would not engage in it myself. I don't even like to watch it on occasion. But when they're in those days, yes, I can truly appreciate the hazardous in any context, not just mountains, it could be just flat. Equally so, um, things could happen. The trains go off track, explode, things fall, you know, accidents are a common feature. Uh, and you're dealing with heavy weight things moving, tons of steel moving, you know. Uh, they didn't have brakes on the trains in those days, you know, except hand brakes. So, I, you know, I, we have to credit them, but I think it just was a way you just accepted it. Feel our standards change and we have a, a much different perspective today. Then again, you have to realize that the Occupational Safety and Act Standards Act, I'm always amazed, was passed only in 1970. So it took a long time. Anyhow, anything else? Any other questions? Why do they call it railroad? The railroad? Yeah, because it's not a road. <laughs> Oh, I wanted to say another thing here. Wait, I wait. Mean, this is here. Do you even think? Do you have any concept? Do you think trucks could replace trains? You know what happened if the train stopped? You know how many trucks you need? You need like 40 pounds of cargo per person, and you know, I don't have the figures with me. You would. You're in a state wouldn't. You would be like a parking lot if you could find the trucks. It would be nothing. You know, I like said nothing about freight, Charlie. I said that. Uh, you know, you'd have to wait like weeks. Highway. There wouldn't be delivery of food, nothing. I didn't say and, nothing you know, about freight rail. A ridiculous highway. It's Highways in a great state tra for moving you know, the people around. A train with 100 cars? There you misinterpreted me, me again, silly Charlie. silly little truck, two I two said truck is going to replace a freight train <laughs> of 125? Authority of truck. God. <laughs> That's an, an absurdity. Maybe the trucks will Have you ever seen what what goes on in an intermodal? Yes, I have. Global one. Yes, I have, you know, Charlie. Where stuff is flying around and you the I trucks have. are going to do that. Yeah, all right. Sure, in conjunction with now. freight rail, not no. passenger rail. You know, and the rails begin from the raw materials to the finished product, and the people. We enjoy riding around and seeing this great country. Anyhow, thank you very much. All right. Get all this out, Charlie. All right. All right. Let's have a good... The College of Complexes meeting is now adjourned.